on the fly, I mean, we, because what happens is so bizarre, we wanted everything to look as real as possible. And uh, uh, in terms of where he was working and the, and the, the we built the, the uh, we had to build build the, the warehouse or that he's, lab and that was in because of the you know, parts of it had to revolve so we could walk on the ceiling and and you know all the if, you know the creature work that had to be done so we had to build the sets up above the ground uh, it's we we spent a lot of time I think working with the effects guys knowing what they needed uh, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, designing what was outside the window so it would look like it wasn't a set because <laughs> we built it kind of a combination of 3d and painted backgrounds uh, some of the what's out the window had to move sometimes when the when the set revolved. <laughs> uh, it uh, it was uh, hard to say. We I, basically we wanted it to look real, except with a twist, with a kind of a bent to it. I guess that came in with the actual telepod. And we, when we first started with the telepods, we we started you know like the we, we, well the very first one I think was kind of a variation on a phone booth. And <laughs> And it was like boring, <laughs> and we came up with some other ideas, and we took them to David. We, we actually took them to his house, and he, and we said, well, we don't think we're there yet, but we thought we'd just bring these along and sit down and just talk about which direction we go. So he said, well, you know, I think I'd like something with lots of fins on it. So we started looking at things with fins, and he said, maybe like my Ducati motorcycle casing. <laughs> so we went out and we took a look at his motorcycle, and, and we took it back to our studio, and uh, we looked at it, and we thought, well, you know, we can't really improve on this a lot. So we just looked at it at different angles. We ended up turning it upside down, and when we turned it upside down, it was like, oh, well, that's it, you know. <laughs> so then it was to make it work, you know. How do you make this work? It has to have a door. It has to have windows, you know. <laughs> and James basically worked on the on the drawings for that, you know. we went through everything that we that was needed and you know how how it was you know what was going to happen when we closed the door and how was the door going to close and you know and uh, that all sort of just all evolved you know from the the phone booth <laughs> at the beginning the rotating room was a I, I've shot a few in California and the Hollywood style is kind of their roots are something else uh, Joe Curtin and the effects designers in Toronto had their own sheet of paper. They'd never done it before. So instead of making a, a box, basically, that, that had, a, a, had a pipe through the middle and it would rotate and you'd kind of squeeze inside, they made this thing out of, completely out of, of sections of corrugated steel, like a, a sewer pipe kind of thing, but this was 22, 24 feet high. And it sat, now it was 30 feet deep, so you made your own huge tube and it sat on wheels and it would rotate with a chain motor. Just a giant horizontal Lazy Susan. And then the, the set went inside that. The real problem was not that the camera, not the lights, but the fact that uh, stories go, as the story went, he ate a lot of junk food and as he turned into the fly and the vomit drop and all that sort of thing. So junk food, unfortunately, we comes in cellophane wrappers. So we littered the set with all the stuff and when it's sitting there, it's fine. When you turn it upside down, it starts to sh quiver and you, the fact of the matter is that's not supposed to happen. He's supposed to walk up the wall, and if anything else does something, kind of gives it away. So that became the big issue, and there were, there was tape and glue guns, all kinds of solutions. I mean, there was an enormous amount of stuff to do, so that was like months. You know, that was months earlier, taking a cast of Jeff Goldblum's entire body, and, and then you had the, um, you had the Brundle fly, the monster at the end. That was a whole mechanical contraption. I mean, I was so busy with the makeup stuff. That was another section. My part was all the stages of the makeup and plus the arm wrestling sequence and, and uh, you know. The, and so we went through different maquettes and everybody was making a maquette of what Rundle Fly would look like. And we went to more like a diseased, deformed look with, you know, one larger eye, contact lens in the later stages. And there was all these subtle stages at the beginning where, he kind of doesn't look very good and he's kind of like blotchy skin and he's got these little fly hairs and all those little details and, and so on. And then he starts to lose his fingernails in that famous scene and uh, lose more stuff. Then it jumps to him being like pretty much deformed, you know, with the big head and, and so on. And the uh, insect politic speech with Gina at the end and he tells her to get out, basically, before something happens. Gina Davis wanted to wear this sweater. When I look at it now, I think, oh, God, it was awful. But 
you know, it was the 80s, and she wanted to wear this, and it was a, I forget, I forget what was on the front, but it was like a great big flower or something that I'd never put on anybody, but at the time she wanted that, and I was new, you know, and you want to please, you don't want to, so we showed that to David, and David said, you know, and, and Gina was upset that she couldn't wear it, but it was David's decision for her not to, and at that time I didn't have the experience to say, well, this is not something David would like or, you know. And then after David said to me, I said, so David, why did you not, something like, why did you not want to use that? And he said, because Denise, this is not a scene about a sweater. And I never forgot that. It, and it isn't, you know, because it, it, you would just sort of be sort of looking at this huge, big flower and you wouldn't see anything else. And I've always remembered that. And it really taught me, you know, from there to be very guarded and sort of visualize the, the, what clothes are going to look like and the connection, almost like a mural, really. And, but I learned that from him. I never forgot that. I didn't think he was right at the time, but he was. <laughs> well, The Fly I saw as an opera. And of course we did, I did, years later write it as an opera but the story had to me had this tragic opera uh, feeling to it and I wanted to do a symphonic score at that point I think it was 1986 and it was actually the first kind of fully integrated symphonic score that I wrote for a film I had done I did a film a few years earlier uh, in New York that uh, used symphony orchestra called Nothing Lasts Forever. And so I felt I was ready now for a full uh, approach to doing that. And the score before The Fly, of course, was video drama, I believe, which was almost a purely electronic score. Uh, so the, the, the Fly was written in that opera mode. And I became very interested in opera at that time, was going to the Metropolitan Opera a lot and was being influenced by it in the way, even to the way the recordings were done. I was setting up my, uh, re re my orchestra recording spatially like the Metropolitan Opera. I was setting it up as if the orchestra was the pit and recording in surround now, left, center, right, and miking things in a specific way like the theater and like the opera and imagining the proscenium or the stage to feel like the film of being in the cinema and feeling like the orchestra is playing right under the uh, projection or behind it, if you will, you know. So I started to incorporate those techniques, not only in the writing and how the pieces were uh, constructed, but also in the, in specifically in the recording. 